Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, segment we have today here at the Data.World Summit. I'm Juan Cicada, Principal Scientist here at Data.World, and it is my pleasure and honor to be joined with my one of my best friends, Mohammed Osser. Mohammed, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Juan. It is, it is, it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to chat with you, with everybody here. Uh, Mohammed is the Chief Data Officer of Domo, former Chief Data Officer at McKinsey, and I've had the pleasure to be spending time with you for almost, what, two, three years? How long has it been? It's been a while. Well, it was June of uh, 2020, I feel like. I mean, it was May of 2020. Something so, like that. And then since then, I think I've become one of your top five folks on your phone. That and you might also be on the top five of my phone too. Although I don't really keep track of who's on the top five and have an equal, you know, opportunity, uh, you know, top on my phone. But I will tell you, I think both of our wives know that we talk to each other probably a little too much. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, let, let, let's get into some other conversations because we'll leave our wives out of this. But so one of the funny well, things, we say good things about our thing, wives. Yeah. All right. So one of the funny things that uh, I guess funny things, yeah, is that we spend so much time talking and it's ended up being this therapy session that we have, right? I think we each kind of go through things and talk with customers, with prospects, and we read things and and we're always sharing all this stuff that we, a couple of months ago or, or just one or two months ago, we started this, this group or whatever on LinkedIn called the data and knowledge therapy. And this is this, this, these next 20 minutes you want to go spend is just kind of sharing with everybody the stuff that we do uh, just chatting every evening or when I'm making pancakes on Sunday, right? That's how it is. <laughs> yeah. I feel like, I, th I feel like we need one of those, um, you know, one of those special chairs that someone can lie down on and then they can tell you all their problems, except this time it can be data problems. Yep. And uh, <laughs> all right. Well, let's start with let's start with this one. So this is the this is the, the main question I have today for you. How do we scale data usage and data access in an organization? Yeah, it's great. It's a great question. I mean, in particular, most organizations just have data in so many different places. And in fact, many of the users or the, the business users, if you will, like don't even know where to start, right? And I think we're going to start to see the emergence of a common knowledge layer. Uh, and that knowledge layer basically has overviews of what, you know, what data sets are out there. And they'll make it easy for folks who are non-data folks, right? The, what I like to say, the 97% of the organization that are non-technical, non-data people to be able to access key entities or key types of data really rapidly and answer questions uh, you know, quite rapidly. So that's where I think we're going. Uh, is there something there yet that you know, gets us to that destination yet? I think we're all trying to work towards it. I don't think we're there yet. But I do think that that's the aspiration, and that's where we need to uh, work towards. Yeah, one of the things that we always talk about is we 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 hear this the customer three sixty, uh, the product three sixty, all these X three sixties, right? But you've had, I mean, throughout your career, you've gone through, you've seen so many developments uh, with organizations that you've been part of yourself, that you've seen, and I love for you to kind of share with us those examples of oh, we've did this. X360 project, we should be able to go reuse that, but we can't. And yeah. why are like why are we, we why are we doing this again and again? Like that's a frustration here. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the art of data engineering, I'd say the art and the science of data engineering is often the the data is being prepared to solve a particular problem, and that data ends up being relatively bespoke. So imagine now you're trying to do a customer retention or customer deepening type of use case. Well, it turns out if you want to do a customer retention or deepening use case, some of the elements of the data are pretty similar. You need data from the service organization. Maybe you want activity and usage data. Maybe you want transaction data. Maybe you want data from the CRM. Maybe you want to understand uh, the different products uh, that they use and so on. So there's all these different data elements you need to bring together. But then when you start building your retention model, you start to create all these features and you engineer your data set to solve that retention use case. Now someone comes in and says, hey, you know, we have this customer question, like how many customers uh, have spent X amount of dollars with us in the last couple of months? 
uh, who didn't spend or how many people spent money with us after this promotion was done and so on. And you start to say, oh, well, we built this, this customer retention data set that we could use. And then you start going deeper into it. And you're like, actually, what we did is we engineered a very bespoke data set to solve that one problem. We kind of have to go back to all those raw data sources again and re-engineer to answer that question on what was the promotions uplift or what was the impact of some digital campaign that we did. And what you end up finding out is that you're constantly kind of, um, you're, you're constantly doing this re-engineering work. And what ends up happening is, is that different parts of the organization, and not one team does all that engineering. Sometimes one team does, it can help sometimes because they have common scripts and so on. And they have knowledge of like the, the intricate knowledge, the tacit knowledge almost of the systems and where the data came from and the inaccuracies in the data and so on. But often it's not the same team. And when it's not the same team, then you get sometimes some divergent results. I do think we have to cool down a little bit and say everybody needs the exact same answer, the same question. Often there are a lot of, if, if, if the differences between the answers are immaterial, they're good enough to you know, work with it. If it is a regulatory use case, then you do need it to be as precise as possible. If every, you know, we want, we want everything to be as correct as possible. But in any case, what you start to see then is uh, when you have different teams, they sometimes create different definitions, they re-engineer different things, and then you get this proliferation problem, right? And so now the question in my mind is, how do you truly, as much as possible, create a common layer of this knowledge layer where you're capturing all of the, the key elements, whether it's the sales data, the service history, et cetera, and, and you, you've defined out with the business, what is an active customer, what is a churn customer, you know, what are campaigns, et cetera. And you've linked that. And I think the the holy grail where, where we can get to is instead of people having to re-engineer every single time, we actually have this dynamic uh, knowledge layer that actually handles the data integration for us. So we don't need people to do it. So it's almost kind of like we built that logic once and we've invested in it. Uh, but now we're enabling that logic to be replicated over and over again. And, and the benefits can be tremendous. Um, the benefits, I mean, imagine if you're able to reduce the 80% of the time that goes into data projects into the data engineering. Imagine you could, if you could reduce that by 70 to 80%. Imagine the agility your organization would have. But again, we have to keep in mind that there is an investment to go build this out. It doesn't just happen by itself. Um, but I do think that if you want scale, you're going to want to move towards that type of model. So, so I think the part of this is, this is really, I think what we need to be focusing on is on scale, all right? This is what I always do, this balance of, do you want to be efficient versus resilient, right? If you're really thinking about being efficient, doing things right now, like I have to go solve this customer churn problem. So I'm going to go get the data for that thing. And you solve that problem, but how are you preparing yourself to be resilient for other use cases going forward? So I think that's one of the shifts that we need to have within an organization of, we need to start having this balance between efficiency and resilience. I think we also need to start separating is that this knowledge layer from like the metrics, the things that we're considering, right? You said it like, what is churn? What is an active customer? What is a real active user and so forth and so forth. And what happens a lot is that we're tying all this data specifically to that particular use case. If we have this separation and, and we think about, okay, what is a user and what are the activities? And then we can let people create these different metrics over that and we can enable them to go ask so many different types of questions which you didn't know that they were gonna go ask. And I think that's the that's how we need to start thinking about it is kind of a separation of what is that knowledge and what are the metrics and the questions that we're gonna be answered because frankly, those questions, those metrics are gonna be a calculation or some formula over that knowledge layer. And to be very specific, I think the knowledge layer, the semantic layer, the ontology, the all, all these words that we see, it's really just understanding what are those core business entities and how yes. those business entities are related to each other. Yeah, one well, and the example that I give is kind of, I mean, we chatted about this once before. It was like Google. Like, you know, imagine in your company, anytime someone had a question, or imagine if you use Google, you type something into the search, and then there was a data engineer in the back who went and got a bunch of data sets and then integrated together, and then, you know, probably two months later, you got some like, you know, halfway accurate answer. No, I'm only kidding. A lot of data engineers will get it back to you in probably like a week or two. Uh, but in any case, imagine if Google did that, like that wouldn't make any sense. Right. And so that's why Google invested in building sort of this knowledge layer, their, their knowledge graph behind the scenes, because they realized 
that, hey, like if people are asking all these questions and the volume of questions is always going to be greater than the capacity that we have as a team to be able to, you know, almost even create our own, um, you know, our own kind of um, static data, data models and so on. We need to actually create a, dyna a dynamic data model that kind of self-updates uh, by itself that, again, that can power all these questions. And that's what they did to power the search. Now, I don't want to go out, out and say everybody needs a knowledge graph and they need to be like Google because Google obviously has a particular problem they solve extremely well. But I think we can glean from this that the amount of questions that we get that our data is needed for is going to far, far outstrip the capacity that we will ever have from a data engineering and analytics talent standpoint. And so we need to start thinking about how do we get scale on those precious resources that we have. So very key takeaway there is for scale, we need to start thinking about that knowledge layer. Now, something that we've had a, a previous conversation, and I really love this analogy, was on this, uh, the job shop and the continuous flow kind of manufacturing. Uh, please illuminate it. Yeah, yeah. So when I was in business school, this was like kind of operations 101. Um, and this was at Harvard Business School. It was like kind of like, you know, just beat into our head a bit, right? Which is like, when you go into a company and you're going to go run a company, you need to know, is that company a production process type of company, like a production continuous flow type of uh, process? Or is it more of a job shop? And what's the difference between the two, right? A production or continuous flow process is something where you def you create something that's pretty well defined, you create a huge volume of it, and you need to make sure the quality of it is standardized and so on. And so what you do is you hire people at different stages of the production process, and they may they may do one part, they may stitch a, I'm, you know, I'm making this up, they may stitch a button on, and another person, you know, applies Velcro and so on, and then you get efficiencies. Uh, by having, and then you have a QA process at the end, and then you produce large volumes. And what ends up happening is the talent you hire for continuous kind of uh, production process are, are different than the job shop, right? These are people who are doing, you know, relatively narrow tasks. You, you, you incentivize them on the speed at which they complete it at, uh, and you have a QA process at the end. Now, Imagine, and, and your sales process is also pretty, uh, you know, when you're selling, you're selling in high volumes and maybe your margins aren't as high, but you make it up in terms of quantity and so on. On the job shop approach is the exact opposite, right? Uh, which is basically saying, hey, what we do is we manufacture a few things that are highly custom to particular use cases. Um, and we have a team of kind of engineers who understand the particular problem that we're making these, you know, uh, widgets for, and, you know, it could be, for example, a ventilator and, or a car, and you're making a very specific type of screw, a, a welding, et cetera. And you have engineers who go in, they know exactly the specifications that need to be met. They know the volume that needs to get met. You have a sales team that's, uh, you know, quite flexible. They're selling to many different customers. They're selling smaller quantities at higher margins. You have a production process that needs to be super flexible to be able to handle all the different types of products you make. It's not going to be a production, like a continuous flow process by any means. It's going to be kind of, you know, uh, people who can do multiple skills at once. And so, you know, I was sharing this example with Juan about that's kind of how, those are the two ends of the spectrum when it comes to operations management and the impact it has on how you run your business. What if you, what if you applied this to data? Mm -hmm. and you start to realize that, many of your use cases, they are, you know, on one end, they're kind of custom. Like someone asks a question, the, the question they ask is, what's the impact of my, you know, um, promotions program? You know, what can we do to help people increase our digital kind of signups for some new service that we have? Like very kind of, these are questions that you constantly get and they require different data behind the scenes to be able to solve. And, in, and for those use cases, you almost need dynamic teams of people who are great problem solvers, who can figure out what data sets to get and to answer. And they operate in sort of this job shop type of mentality. And then you've got a whole set of custom, I wouldn't say custom, but you have this continuous flow process where you've got these standard data sets, the standard knowledge layer that everyone's accessing. And what you're doing is you're ensuring that the uptime is there. 
if there's any data drift issues that you're man managing. And it becomes very much like a continuous flow process. Now, what's really interesting is organizations kind of have to handle both. They need these folks who are working on the use cases to now create new entities, new concepts, engineer new ideas. And then what they need to do is they need to promote that into some sort of continuous flow process when they realize, hey, we, we've got a lot of customers that are gonna take this raw ingredient and use it for their different use cases. And so in an organization, that means you can't have one data team that handles both. You sometimes actually need two different types of data team. One really focus on that production data process, that you know data ops process, and another one that's really focused on the consumption and the development and, and the application to the use cases. And then you need to have a harmonious cycle in terms of how do you promote things to go into that production process? Yeah, th this was a great analogy when, when you first told me about it. And it's, I think the important thing is to realize that you're, if you're starting, it's probably going to be, all of it's going to be like a job shop, very custom. And then you realize, wait, more people are asking for this stuff. And I get it to a point that I can graduate it to a, a continuous flow. And at some point you realize I, you want to start identifying what are those things that are, are that goes on to that continuous flow. And I think that's how, even where you start seeing uh, the whole product thinking into data. Uh, we, we've been pushing out our, our ABCs of data product, right? Your data product should be what is accountable, who owns it, who's responsible for that, uh, what are the boundaries, what is this thing? Was well, the term it's, ownership that's very controversial these well, days. Well, let, let's say who 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 fixes it? it? Who, who's, yeah, who fixes yeah. it when it breaks? Who that fixes type it when thing, it breaks? Right? Who's responsible? Okay, who's this, who's responsible? B is for boundaries. What is this thing? What isn't it? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? C. Uh, what are the contracts and expectations around this? D, who are the downstream consumers? Uh, and E, what is the explicit knowledge? What is uh, the schemas? How is this related to other things? So we need to start bringing in that product thinking. And, and, and also, is, is this that job shop approach? Is it a continuous in getting there? But I want to go get into our... But no, one, one last point just on this job shop versus continuous flow. I think then it also becomes a question on how do you organize your data teams, right? Like your central team might be responsible for that assembly line, that continuous flow process. But then you may have teams that sit in your different, you know, divisions, you know, and in your different uh, business lines that are actually taking data from that, that central team. And they're more responsible for, you know, the application angle. And then the applications are so much greater uh, than even what the central team is even aware of, right, to a certain extent. And so yeah. You have to start thinking about it, like how do you design your data teams to be able to truly take advantage? This is what we say that you you really need to find the balance between centralization, decentralization that best works for your organization, for your culture, right? So there is no one size fits all in here. But leads me to the second point we want to go make here is we need to focus on the end users, on the end customers. So actually, if, if you search on LinkedIn for data and knowledge therapy, that's our group. You can find a couple of posts that we've already written. And the last two posts have been on the yeah. lack of focus on customers. And I look how we, you did this analysis on searching for employees and big companies and LinkedIn and realize that really only 3% of employees and, and large companies actually work in data while that 97% don't, and they don't really care about the bubble, that data bubble. Yeah. And I mean, it's one is probably even, um, even skewed more heavily to like my hunch for those who are, of us who are on this call on this VC today, right? Um, that a vast majority of us are probably way more advanced than even these big companies that some, some of these big companies are even right. Um, I actually think that the amount, the market for like non data people is so much larger than the market for data people. Um, and we are kind of in a little bit of a bubble where we like sit around, we talk about all these great new tools. We, there's a lot of great money out there. And so, and by the way, that's, which is great. We've got this innovation happening at an unprecedented rate, but the diffusion, the true diffusion of this innovation to the entire market is still extremely, extremely low. There are so many companies today that are medium-sized companies that frankly probably have maybe one person that knows about the data, but is they're not even leveraging their data. And that's not even included in this three to 97%. And imagine 
that's a large swath of the types of companies that there are that exist out in the market. And that's just, by the way, this is just the, that's the United States of America. Now think about outside the United States of America and the different maturity levels. So we are very much the privileged few who are talking about all these great, you know, knowledge layers and semantic layers and all this great stuff. Uh, the vast majority of the world uh, doesn't even have a clue as to what we're talking about. And that's why I, I would say we need to go from this world of a data first to a knowledge first world. But what I mean knowledge first world is people first. I need to understand who are the people in my organization? What do they actually want and why understand that? Second, context first. I wanted to, I mean, people ask questions, they depend depending on their domains, depending on their on their use cases, they're gonna be many different things. And third, it's relationships first. How 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 do these different departments do people actually interact and what are the different yeah. needs? That's the aspect we need to start thinking about. But it all starts with understanding the end users, the 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 the, the end customer there. And then third point I wanted to make, Mohammed, is how do we actually start? Right, because we're like talking. Well, we should be doing the semantic layer. We should be uh, having generating scale and start using more data. Yeah. But our point is that the same way we have metrics for our business, right? What's revenue? What is the active user, and so forth? We should keep track of the metrics of how the data is being used. And I think we need to have this baseline. Understand where are we today, so we know where we should go improving. And and I know you've in your previous role, Mackenzie, like you've had a. Uh, You've, you've been able to bring on thousands and thousands of, of, of users out of catalog. So yeah, um, let, let's talk a little bit about metrics here for, for the last couple of minutes. Yeah, I mean, what I've seen time and time again is the organizations that truly kind of become data-driven, they do think about sort of this data democratization, building this data culture. And if it sounds fluffy, data culture, but it really, you can put some metrics around it and make it a lot harder and quantitative what percentage of your employees are searching for data on any given day or any given month? What percentage of your employees are logging into the analytics tools and conducting an analysis? And we've actually seen not a Domo that some of our customers have truly, truly become data enabled. Like their executive teams have analyses that show by department, how many people have been using Domo and the different analytics, cap you know, the, the different data sets and so on. And immediately the CEO of the organization can say, hey, marketing, like you're behind the rest of the organization. Supply chain is using a lot more data and more people are engaged, right? So you need some of those quantitative measurements to look at what the adoption looks like. You also need to marry that with a community. In some cases, it could be like the, you know, at McKinsey, we create the find the data community, right? And we had thousands of folks, experts from across the organization who were, it was like this kind of amazing place where someone had a question, people would come answer that question because you had all these different experts there. I know other retailers have done that as well, where they truly create this community and that community then fosters um, these different events that then you hold. That's just on the data culture side, right? That I think uh, matters quite a bit. There's also a piece here about, you also have to have these impact stories. You have to be thinking about how can you highlight, you know, the five, 10 examples that just captures the imagination of all the leaders within your organization so they realize what's possible with data. In some cases, um, you need to make it look like it's magic. Yeah. So when you make it look like magic, people are like, that's really cool. I wanna go talk to the data team. I wanna I want talk to them about a problem that I have. How can I solve it? Because again, 97 plus percent of people don't even understand what's possible with the data. Very few people know what's even possible. You look like you're some sort of like, you know, um, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to describe it, but like you have like the superpower, right? So, so, so th th this is a great point for us to just yeah. have some very concrete takeaways for everybody. Number one, scale data usage and access in your organization with a knowledge layer. Yeah. Second, focus on the end user, on the customer, who's actually going to be using that data, right? Get out of the 3% of your data bubble and focus on that 97% and understand what their needs are. And what we were just talking, let's go define metrics to track data usage. 
And here are actually some of those questions that Mohammed was just talking about, right? How many employees are searching for data, right? How many of them are actually logging into their catalog? What is your adoption rates? I mean, D Domo as data.world, we really focus on metrics and we bring this up to all our users and to all the stakeholders to understand, define what success looks like and what success looks like from three months, six months from now. And with that, Final, the three takeaways there. Mohammed, it is a pleasure. I'm so happy we get to do this and uh, keep, uh, look us up on LinkedIn and look for our data and knowledge therapy. Yeah, we'll follow, follow us, follow us. Um, maybe at some point we'll uh, we'll chat while Juan's making pancakes or something, right? Love it. <laughs> Thank All you right. so much, Mohammed. you have a great one. Take care now, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.